Let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for the, the breath that we have in our lungs. Thank you for the sight that we have, the hearing, and all the faculties that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for all of that. Father, today, this morning, we're talking about that glorious, glorious work, your church, your son's bride. We ask you, Father, that your hand would be upon this conversation this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would bless this time. And, Lord, we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As you can see, we're in chapter 25. And believe it or not, we have eight more uh, chapters to go. We're almost there. We're getting there. <coughs> it's been a pleasure. It's been a long journey, but it's been a good journey. Uh, it's been a journey that's been a tremendous blessing to me, hopefully uh, for you as well. But this morning we're going to be looking at the church. So without further ado, we'll look into the... We're going to, before I go any further, we're going to take this chapter, we're going to divide it in two. We're going to read the first three sections, and then we'll talk about that, and then we'll do the last three sections. Okay, I'll go ahead and read those three sections together. And um, the Catholic or universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ, the head thereof and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Section two, the visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, not confined to one nation as before under the law, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion together with their children and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. And then section three, unto this Catholic visible church, Christ has given the ministry, oracles, and the ordinances of God for the gathering and perfecting of the saints in this life to the end of the world, and doth, or does, excuse me, by his own presence and spirit, according to his promise, Make them effectual thereunto. Now, so as we read in these sections, we notice that the confession here in these sections are talking about two aspects of the church the visible and the invisible. Now, <clears throat> the visible body is who we come in contact with, so to speak. I mean, to put it at a basic level, it is people that we come to church with Sunday after Sunday. And then if we look at that in a broader sense, it is also the church that is throughout the United States, throughout the world, and you know that we can actually, like if we decided today to go to Uganda and we wanted to go to a Reformed church there, we could. You know, I'm just saying if there was a, a body of believers that we, the way we believe being there. Now, the invisible church, we have no idea fully who they are. Now, you know, we know in the Word of God, it says that we, we can know people by the fruit that they bear. And we, we know, have a sense, if, whether or not they're a true believer. But we fully and truly do not know. Only God knows who that person is. And we notice, too, the language of the church. It's the body of Christ. It's the bride, the spouse, um, you know, in whom we belong to, Right? We belong to Christ. We are in Him. And this church, visible and invisible, are made of true members who profess in the true religion. Now, with that, also, there are also what we call false members mingled in with that. We don't know who they are. Like I say, you could go to church with somebody for years and think that you know them. You could be a believer. So you think, they do all the right things. They cross their T's and dot their I's. They, all, they say the right prayers. They uh, talk to you about reading passages of scripture and probably have nowhere or no, are nowhere close to having a relationship with God. Just as lost as lost can be. 
Now, <clears throat> in relation to the visible church, the invisible church is a, a lot smaller. Okay? We, we don't know what those bounds are. We have no way of knowing. God knows, but we don't. But they're comparatively smaller than the visible church, so to speak. Because remember, the visible church, we see, we come in contact with the invisible church. Only God fully knows who those people are. Uh, question. Uh, are they both the true church? They, they are, because in the visible church, you do, you do have true members. You do. When, when we talk about the invisible church, that's where I, I have difficulty with a little bit trying to decipher and the best way I understand maybe Michael you can help me with this is like I was saying the uh, is only the ones who God fully knows am I correct in saying that or is there is there more to that no I think that's that's fine um so I want to affirm you know we we, we confess that there is one holy Catholic and Apostolic right. church right and so when we confess that there is one church we run into this problem of again which is the actual <laughs> church the visible and the invisible right um, but I think that the problem is really not so much um, that distinction as it is a, a temporal or a chronological problem yeah. because the invisible church is really just the visible church left standing on the last day, right? <laughs> right. It's an eschatological feature. Right. It is, right. in, you know, so, and that yeah. comes manifest at the judgment. And so it is the visible church. <laughs> All those are actual Christians. Right. Well, yeah. but, uh, you know, and, and, and to add to that, correct me if I'm wrong, and to add to that, the mm -hmm. visible church even though we can't fully see it now, we're about the business of what we've been commanded to do, right? And then, like Michael said, at that last day, the invisible church will may be made visible. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, the portion of believers at any time are small in comparison to all the believers of all countries and generations. And two, because we are able to see the body, the very boundaries of the invisible body are not fully delineated, just like we were talking about here. Now, um, we understand that there are those that appear to be believers, as we've talked about, um, but are not. And there are those that are believers and cannot fully make that manifest. You know, I think of China. They can't fully make manifest or make it known to everybody that they're believers because they'll get killed. You know, the communist regime over there is suppressing them. Or they may be in another country where the dominant religion being Islam, they have to remain underground. But here in the US, we can make it known. We have that, we have that liberty, we have that yeah. freedom to do so. Now, <clears throat> Any questions so far about what we talked about? Okay. Now, as we discussed before, the Catholic visible church comprises of all people, of all nations, who profess the true religion along with their children. And I think this is very important. Um, along with their children. So you have the elect and their children. And I think here at Covenant of Grace, we do a very good job of, of um, making that known. So, you know, we baptize our children, right? Because it, we bring them into that covenant relationship, into that family. And I believe this is what uh, is being um, uh, spoken of here. And this entails the persons who are living with an abounding faith, those who have wonderful, lively faith, and then there, and also those who have what we call a diminished faith or a simmering faith. And they're bringing forth the fruit of holiness on earth. However, this is, this is always at times with greater or less clearness. Uh, as we've been talking about, there are times when we can see this, it's evident, and there's times when we can't. Less evident. The visible universal the visible universal church is part of the invisible church at large. <laughs> so you, you have this you have this mixing, you know, so to speak, with the visible and the invisible, as Michael was saying. We don't know fully who, who they are, but God does. God does. 
Now, um, now this truth concerning the gathering of believers into ecclesiastical communities with constitutions, laws, and standards, titles, ordinances, and discipline is all for the sole purpose of gathering in the elect. Uh, each, each ecclesiastical community or church, um, if we could use that term, who are faithful to Christ, the eternal king, is an essential component of the visible church. All the faithful ecclesiastical communities together in all nations of all people constitute the Catholic visible church. Therefore, being the body of Christ, it cannot ever be divided. <clears throat> Since the church is rendered visible, it is safe to illustrate the truth that it is because of the profession of members coming into the church. And we certainly understand that a profession can be superficial. We do recognize that. But here we're talking about true professions of faith in Christ Jesus. The truth of the of this notion is set forth, you know, in the parable. Yes, sir. Um, I think it's important too to, to highlight that as you mentioned in this uh, your your distinction between the invisible and visible church yeah. uh, uh, consists there. That when the divines here say that the visible church consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion yes. and their children, uh, it's, it's important, I think, to understand that, and I think that they're right about this, that includes even those who aren't genuinely believers, who are not truly regenerate. Right. Um, they and their children, if they are members of what is in fact a Christian church, uh, the visible church is uh, the broad category, and as you have there, the invisible church is a subset of that, because right. again, it's not that they're part of the separate church, it's right. that they're the ones that are going to be left standing on the last day. Yes. But, the, the, the true church does involve all those who are involved in those uh, ecclesiastical bodies where yeah. you have things like the word being proclaimed, where you have Trinitarian baptism, baptism and so on. Yes. And, and so uh, going to the baptism issue, right? Uh, yeah. The reform, of course, they accepted Roman Catholic baptism as lawful baptism. Uh, Charles Hodge debated this with Thornwell. Thornwell, as much as I love him, I think he was wrong about this. Uh, Hodge argued that, uh, yeah, we're, that was right, that it, as impure as the Roman Catholic Church is, yeah. that's a legitimate Christian church that was a legitimate lawful Christian baptism. Right. Um, and so it, you have these, these ecclesiastical bodies that are greater or lesser, greater or lesser purity. They may not be saved, but hey, right. that's a... Yes, a very good point. Thank you. That brings another question to mind. Okay, so I'm looking at the donut. In the, in, the, in the visible churches, I could put dots in that to represent those that are not sheep but goat. Right. But they are the sheep in the elect of God within the visible church. And my question is, <clears throat> the invisible church would be inclusive of those that are called in the visible church plus those that we don't know about. Right. That makes sense. Is that right? It, it does. And, and, and you're, uh, let me just say this right now, and I'll let you finish it. Thank you. Uh, it, it, you know, like Michael brought out in one time, one of the chapters that we read about, you know, Christ's atonement was efficacious for all, everybody in the future and everybody past. So when we speak of the, uh, the church, you know, we go all the way back to Adam, you know, all those people. You know, you know I think oftentimes, you know, I'm guilty of this. I think of just from here forward without thinking about from here past or from the time of Christ atoned to the past. But they were the church. You know, they, they did believe in God. They, you know, as we look back, they look forward in types and signs and symbols. Yeah. So that invisible church includes all of them as well. Too. Also, yes. Mike. Right. Um, so the, I just want to add that, that yeah. uh, looking from a from an Old Testament perspective and talking about the Old Testament yeah. saints, um, the, the the ceremonies and the types that they had, mm -hmm. these types of shadows, were actually of course sacraments of the Old Testament visible church. Yeah. And so even they belong to a visible church under its Old Testament dispensation. Right. Right. Now the section one of our of our confession in this chapter yeah. indicates that um, the invisible church will include all of the elect, of course, that have their shelving. Now that 
I, I get what they're doing there. If they're looking at it over a period of time. Yes. Um, but but the danger there could be to suggest that a person could be uh, a truly regenerate believer and be existing uh, coordinately but outside of the visible church, right. which is why at the last portion of section two, <laughs> there is out of, out of which there is an ordinary possibility of salvation. And I, I think we cannot stress that enough. Exactly. Exactly. You know, uh, salvation is through the church, period. And we don't think of the church as being a building. The church is us. You and me and everybody. You know, salvation can only come through the church to those who are lost. That's how, that's how it is. Christ did not commend it to anybody else. He commended it to his bride, and therefore we are commanded to go forth and bring those people in. Very good. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Well, what about the poor person out in the forest, in the whatever, that can't join a church or be part of a church? That is a belief. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so, so you're assuming that so the person is regenerate. They've heard the gospel. They believe by some means, and you're saying that they yes. can't join a church because there is there's no right. there's not one. So um, <laughs> this is why they include the qualification: no ordinary possibility of salvation. Because that would be an extraordinary circumstance. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. if you get two or three of them together, you got a church. Okay. Uh, I was looking at the board here with all our missionaries, and this gentleman here and his wife Rhoda are in Pakistan. They operate. He is over a hospital in Pakistan that is a Christian hospital with Christian schools that are teaching the Word of God according to the Confessions. Uh, and, and there's several others there uh, in China. I have a sister that went over, and she's a doctor in English, and and and, and or has her doctorate, and she went and spent time mission work in China, worshiping and teaching underground Chinese people that they knew, if they were ever caught, they would be. Yeah. Even even her and the other people that went with her. And, and this is getting off topic a little bit. What does persecution do to the church? I mean, you know, you, you might be able to squish it over here, but it's just going to come out and go over here and over there. It just spreads. You know, when we we look at persecution, nobody wants to be persecuted. Nobody's, you know, uh, in that club. Hey, I, you know, persecute me. The persecution is used by God to grow this church, okay? And, you know, and, and, and praise, praise God for that. You know, I, there's a huge underground church in China. Uh, I you know, give God all the glory for that. I got a tape of them worship in a dark room, right? Yeah. That, that I, first time I heard it, but yeah. it's a video taken from a camera, a yeah. phone. I just cried. Yeah. I mean, it was like, Eight yeah. people in a small dark room. Yeah, and, and you know, and what's sad is too, in light of that, you know, you hear you got the you've got the government is taking down any symbol of Christianity completely down, crosses off of churches. Uh, if you don't have the Communist Party pictures in your house, they come and arrest you. If you're caught worshiping Christ, they take you to prison. Uh, you know, and sometimes you never return. And we truly have a lot to be thankful for here. Yes, and, we do. and I don't mean this to be mean, but it would probably do us good to have more persecution here. And, and it's coming. I mean, we see it coming. So um, sections one, two, and three educate us about God providing the Catholic visible church and its various denominations along with its integral sections with the following. The inspired scriptures as an infallible oracle and guide slash rule of faith and pet practice to the gospel ministry, a distinctive certified and designated by physical contact by, by excuse me, but solely by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Three, the commands of preaching, prayer, singing of praise, and the holy sacraments. And four, the great and marvelous conclusion, which Michael uh, as was talking about the gathering of the elect from the children of the church of the world uh, 
excuse me, uh, tied into what Michael was saying, the gathering of the elect from the children of the church or the world and the perfecting of the saints when gathered. The very victory of these organizations within the church is secured beyond measure by the promise of Christ in being with us to make us efficacious to the end of the world. In that, in that final day, the, visible church, uh, the invisible church will be made visible for all the glory of God. <clears throat> These sections go on to teach uh, also that there is no remote possibility, as we've been discussing, of anyone attaining salvation outside the confines of the visible church. Um, therefore, this applies to all people outside of the visible church. Now, um, Hodge, I was reading his commentary, and he is of the opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, he is of the opinion that even the children of the unsaved, uh, if they die in infancy, they will be redeemed as well. And I've heard on other sides, uh, on the other side of that, that only the children of the elect will be saved. Now, you know, Michael, I mean, if you, you want to add to that or help with that, uh, what, what is your opinion on that? that is, of course, it's a difficult question because yeah. of the lack of, of, of abundantly clear data in yeah. Scripture on it. Now, I think that uh, you could go uh, to the position, again, as you said, Hodge believed, and this seems to have been done within Presbyterianism from the 19th century onward, right. that says all of the infants who die in infancy, no matter whether their parents are inside right. or outside of the church, right. are, are saved. Is, is there a possibility of that? Um, yeah, I think it's possible. Uh, I think that it's the safe ground is to say that um, if you have people who are in the church and as a pastoral issue mm. and they lose infants, well, look, they're in the visible church. You can assure them of the grace of God for them and for their children. Right. And so there's an assurance there. Right. Um, I, I, I would be uh, uncomfortable being that emphatic right. with those outside, um, although again, it may be possible. Right, and, you know, and from a pastoral standpoint too, uh, you have to really be careful how you say that to people because they get mad and, and leave and you never see them again. And I say that we, you know, we hold the truth away from them or anything like that, but when it comes to things like this that uh, you know, you're not real certain about, you have to be really careful. Um, you know, in, in the side that I've heard as far as uh, people believing that only the elect infants will go to heaven, they use the scriptural uh, passages concerning David when uh, after he committed the sin with Bathsheba, when she gave birth to a son, he died. And then David said, well, one day I will see my son again, you know, to something to that effect. So that, that's one, one of the hills that people use to, to back that up. Yes, sir. Um, it's also possible to, uh, to draw a midway point even between saying, okay, all infants uh, are perish, and then only uh, the children of the elect yeah. are saved. Uh, it, it's possible to say, well, what about the infants who die in infancy? Regardless of whether their parents are genuine believers, the fact is, is they are still in the church. And let's say, you know, they are they are parts, you know, they do have a right to, if they live long enough, they have a right to Christian baptism. Yeah. And by virtue of being born within this community. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's as a sign of the covenant of grace, is there an assurance that, okay, they died in infancy, so we take comfort that God's grace was on them. Right. Um, I think that that's reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you have to, especially when uh, a mother who was just going to give birth to a baby, and, and you know, yeah, you don't want, you, you say something like that, and you'll just set off a, a hellstorm of fire. You know, it, it'll bury you. Any questions so far on what we're discussing here? To suggest that there is no possibility of salvation outside the visible church is affirmed in the following. One, God has never revealed his intent of saving any adult that is void of any knowledge of Christ. Two, the very fact of the unremarkable heathen experience, heathen, you know, basically no knowledge of Christ, demonstrates the notion that no one outside the knowledge of Christ will be saved. Three, the declaration that God has proclaimed that those that deny his son shall not be saved. And four, 
every man that hears the gospel of Jesus Christ is commanded to declare it in confessing Christ publicly, which is to be a visible profession of the true religion. Romans 10, verses 9 through 10, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And we do recognize that there are other ways of publicly professing this. But the command is to be publicly confessing Christ. We do that in our lives. We do that when we come in contact with people who are not saved or people who are saved. We're commanded to confess that. It is, the, uh, it is a public, it's a public dis demonstration of the true profession, of the true religion. Now, you know, and also too, we have to make mention here that um, any Christian that does not obey that command is basically, essentially, denying Christ. And therefore, we need to be careful of that. We need to make sure in our lives that we're publicly confessing when given the opportunities or in our lives with other people and so forth. Now, that brings us to the last three sections here. <clears throat> this Catholic Church has been called sometimes more called, uh, excuse me, has been called more, sometimes less visible, and particular churches, which are members thereof, are more or less pure, according as doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced, ordinances and ministered, and public worship performed more or less purely in them. Section 5, the purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. And some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, there shall be always a church on earth to worship God according to his will. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof. But is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. That's pretty heavy language there in that last uh, section towards the Pope. Uh, it, it, you know, what we see there, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, we see uh, you know, how these people truly felt about the Pope, about the Roman Catholic Church. They saw the Pope as the Antichrist. And I can't say I have much, I mean, I don't much blame him. I mean, look at all what the Roman Catholic Church has done. You know, the persecutions, the insurrections, and so forth. Um, and the lies that they uphold. So, in dealing with the previous sections, we dealt with, at length, the visibility of the church and what constitutes the visible Catholic Church and the invisible church. Now, we are looking more or less to the degrees of purity generation of the churches and who that head of the visible church is and is not. We understand that the uh, visible church, visible Catholic church is comprised only of professors of the true religion, as we stated before, with the ecclesiastical organizations that have remained loyal to the head, Jesus Christ. Now, they have maintained, and, and being loyal, we mean they have maintained sound doctrine. They have been more or less visible in the world, uh, and the fundamental church remained more or less pure to the purity of the doctrine that they profess in conjunction with the worship they hold to, to their fervor, sp spirituality, enthusiasm, and to the purity of their membership, which is maintained, well, excuse me, maintained by discipline, as we uh, discussed yesterday. Um, so as these three areas um, that we just read about are concerned with the advance, or, or, uh, are advanced in perfection, the church will be more visibly discriminated in the world. So as these areas are advanced in perfection, the church will become more discriminated in the world. 
Therefore, the church will be pure and free from heterogeneous aspects, and the church will be more consecrated in accomplishing the chief goal in which she was created for. In questions so far? Okay. The purity of the church has varied among the overall churches in degrees, and we understand at the present time that the teaching of scriptures concerning the nature of the kingdom, the nature of man, is imperfectly sanctified. And the overall experience of the churches helps us to see that even the purest churches are very imperfect. Churches will continue to be imperfect until the end. And as we have seen in our own time, and there will be more churches that will become corrupt, if not already. Perfect examples of such corruption. One, the ancient church of Israel, you know, who read in 1 King, Kings 19, under the reign of Ahab, you know, Elijah, what does he do? He runs, you know, he starts feeling sorry for himself. I'm the only one left. And God says, no, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. There's always a remnant. And then also, too, um, we, we see also with the apostolic church, or not the apostolic church, excuse me, with the apostles. They, they create, or not create, but they uh, build up these churches throughout the Roman Empire. And what ends up happening? Most of them end up conforming to the Roman Catholic system. They went away. They become corrupt. Protestant churches also uh, have given way to apostasy. The Roman Catholic Church, the main church here that, that comes into focus, and I believe with the uh, divines as well, maintains that purity is secure by Christ's promises, which the infallible orthodoxy and purity of the visible church in subjection to the apostolically ordained bishops will be to the end of the world. Well, you know, and, and Hodge notes, he, he adds here, he says that would be a good sentiment if only the Roman Catholic Church was a legitimate ecclesiastical organization. And I would agree with him on that. We must understand that this uh, purity is not any, excuse me, is not any outward visible organization that maintains so-called succession of priests and bishops, but it is in the true invisible body of the elect, true believers of all countries and times, which is supported one, in the span over 2,000 years in which we have defined thus far, but not in the Roman Catholic sense of accomplishment. Two, some of the epistles, some of the epistles that we have in the New Testament are even addressed to the church. But at the same time, this phrase is given an explanation as what the church is. In the, you know, and we see this in their respected salutations, such as the words of the called, the saints, the elect. Therefore, as we understand, then that, uh, excuse me, therefore, as we understand, these same attributes are ascribed to those that are members of the true church. These attributes ascribed to the true believers of the true church attest to the fact that the true church is spiritual and, as explained, invisible, not outwardly organized. Any questions so far? We're almost done here. Yes, sir. Me? Yeah, I thought you were raising your hand. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I did. I, uh, section 5, when, when you read it mm -hmm. and you see how important the responsibility is to look after the church and the sheep to keep yeah. it from going awry, yeah. it, it belongs to the responsibility of all of us, but there, yes. there is a group God holds accountable to make sure it doesn't. Yes. And when you vote for elders in this church, you better make sure that with confidence you can support somebody being on the session because they're, in the life of this church, we've had many apostate, I won't call them psychopaths, but they, they, <laughs> that we've had to repel. And yeah. church don't know that. Right. The, you got, your elders have to be brave enough to stand up 
to Rome. And you get elders that try to please people, and then the church goes south. Absolutely. And it's critical. It, it is. And, uh, it, and it's critical on multiple fronts. You know, it's critical on the ministry in the pulpit, making sure the Word of God is being preached, that you know, we have a minister in here who is preaching the Word of God, not the opinions of man, not politics, but those, the pure Word of God. That's what the flock needs. And it behooves the leadership of individual churches to make sure that that ministry is untainted as much as we can. And that means also, too, keeping people outside who come in who are trying, who are ravenous wolves looking to destroy the ministry of the church, right? So it's, it's a multifaceted front. It's not an easy front. It's not easy. But as uh, Bill was saying, are we willing to see that and be able to address that? And in, in the confession here, you know, attest to the fact that many churches have fallen prey, have fallen away from the faith. You know, we don't have to go into detail what some of those churches are. We know who they are. But they've gotten away from the Word of God. And they have a, they're just like the world. You can't even tell the difference between them and the world. So. Therefore, the uh, relationship that the invisible church maintains with the visible church may be laden with heresies and diminished by mere defection, but the invisible church will never be removed from the earth. So the true church will not be visible by mere attachment to another organization, the size of it, or because of allegations, but by her purity, faith, the spiritual activity, and the fruitfulness of her membership. In addition, there is not one person, humanly speaking, that resides as the head of the church. There's only one person, Christ. He is the head of the church. Nobody on this side of glory is the head of the church. And that's why, you know, in my heart, I believe, and I'm of the opinion, the plurality of leadership is so important. Because you eliminate that one person who says, hey, I got this. No, you don't. Sit down. <laughs> but plurality, hey, you know, God has called us together. And therefore, let us glorify him. Doesn't mean that everything that uh, leadership and plurality, you know, plural leadership is not perfect. There's mistakes that are made. Sure. We're fallible. We're sinful. And we do make mistakes. But it also, the most important thing is, because of plurality, it honors God. It was never intended for one person to rule the church. We have seen the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church as a prime example, as history has taught us, of just how corrupt an organization can become with one person in leadership. It was never intended for that. The Roman Empire, also exhibited that as well. Um, now, you do have some Roman Catholics with that will assert, uh, you know, because the church has uh, government and laws, and therefore there needs to be one, uh, there needs to be one in whom Christ can delegate his authority to, which the visible church can be ma maintained. We know that the Roman Catholics support this idea for the sole purpose of the Pope. For their support, they look to Peter, uh, where they draw their support from, they look to Peter as their foundation for the delegation of Christ's authority to a member of the visible church. However, there are some Protestant groups that believe that the rulers of their countries are the ones in whom Christ has delegated his authority to govern the visible church. You know, England being a prime example of that. Miserable, I mean, just utter miserable, misery, dealing with a king over the church. Uh, you know, as we read in chapter 23 of our confession, you know, as ordained as civil authority is by God, God never intended the civil authority to be mingled in with ecclesiastical authority. 
is a separate institution, and it needs to be a separate institution. The king, president, whoever has no authority over what the church does. Now, that doesn't mean that we, we can go out here and commit murder and do things like that. That falls under civil jurisdiction. But as far as ecclesiastical matters go, civil authority needs to stay out, has to stay out. Now, <clears throat> so finally, that leaves one question. And I know you guys know the answer to that. So who is the head of the church? Christ. Christ. Absolutely. He is, he is over and governs his church through his inspired, infallible, and faithful word, which is the perspicuous rule of faith and practice, and by the apostolic institutions of the sacraments and ordinances, along with other aspects, and then three, through his own spiritual presence to all members of his church unto the very end. And our confession also addresses uh, you know, the very strong language about the Pope being the Antichrist. I don't think the, the divines may have, but I don't think they were absolutely specifically focusing on one person in that seat. I think they were looking at the papal system overall as being the Antichrist. And um, that's how I feel too, and maybe maybe I'm off on that, but um, you know, evil is continually changing its face. You know, it's always changing its form and uh, coming up with something new, but uh, to undo the kingdom of God. But we know that the kingdom of God will never be undone. She will be presented at that final day as a glorious work that God has spoke of eternity past. She'll be the epitome of all the glorious works that God has performed. And praise God for that. You know, it just attests to the fact that the church is continuing on and it will continue on. Nothing's going to prevent that. Not even Satan himself. Not even the gates of hell prevail against it. Any questions as we close? Any comments? Okay. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, Thank you for your church. Lord, we do recognize as imperfect as she is, she will be made perfect one day. And what a beautiful sight that will be. Father, it also compels us on multiple fronts here. One is leadership uh, to ensure that we maintain the purity. The purity that's been um, evident in membership and, and faithfulness to the word and, and living out that and then two that we go and profess seeking those in whom you have elected and whom you have called lord we cannot sit idly by but we have to go out and proclaim that to make a public profession to proclaim the truths the glorious truths of your son give us the strength to do that lord Father, I pray for Michael as he preaches today. Uh, I pray that your work will go forward. I pray that your word will be edifying, convicting, and also too, Lord, encouraging as we focus our attention upon you. Lord, I thank you for Michael. I thank you for his endeavors. I thank you, Father, uh, for uh, what you have done in his life. We praise you for that, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Where was everybody? They forgot to sit. Yeah, it's right forward. It is. I told Janet, it said you just get one hour. Just